again, you use drugs recreationally. Uh, will you give us your word you're not going to use them anymore? I mean, that's just about where we're at. In the last six years. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jake. Okay, well, that's what you Let's tell drug addicts. Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll take you on your word. That's how our that's how our legal system should work, and that's how those who enforce the legal sh system sh should work. You know that, Gordon. We should take people their word. Especially those that <laughs> enforce our law. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> what is what is your opinion on that, Shane? Well, you know, living here in Albuquerque, and uh, two former Albuquerque police officers, um, I, I hired two of them. Uh, both of both of them were former Albuquerque police officers, uh, both had stellar careers. One was a, a sergeant supervisor, uh, the other had retired from Philadelphia Police Department and then went to work for Albuquerque Police Department. They both left due to uh, corruption. They, they saw the handwriting on the wall and said, I don't want to be a part of this. Right. I'm not going down with the ship. And they elected to get out of there. They interviewed with me, and, and I hired both of them, and I was, I was you know, honored to have them aboard. They were both tremendous assets to, to my agency. I really enjoyed having them. Uh, so my point in saying all of that is I had an inside um, scoop as to what was really transpiring within the ranks. Right. Of course, if you guys are, have followed uh, my history at all, you understand that uh, I was involved in a, a high-profile case where I was investigating an Albuquerque police officer for uh, allegedly murdering his wife and attempting to make it look like a suicide. Yes. And so I, I really got to see the good, the bad, and the ugly of Albuquerque Police Department. Now, not to sit here and beat up on Albuquerque Police Department, but they're four times the national average for deadly force incidents. Mm -hmm. That's a four times. Four times the national average. We're talking about an, an agency uh, nowhere near the size of Los Angeles Police Department that pulls the trigger four times uh, what that large agency would. Now, here in Albuquerque, this, this young lady, uh, unfortunately, just lost her life. Uh, that particular situation where she, you know, to my knowledge, everything that I've studied on the case was unarmed. There's been multiple cases where this Albuquerque police officers have used deadly force against an unarmed citizen. Now, the, my, in my opinion, because you asked for my opinion, yes. so my so humble... Uh, yet somewhat accurate opinion, I feel that this is due to uh, three major things. Number one, in New Mexico, they have what, what's known as shoot-first training. Uh, they desensitize people. Right. So when you're at the academy, when you're going, they put up uh, posters, uh, you know, targets of old men, uh, young children, pregnant women, things of this nature. Oh, the no-hesitation uh, targets? The, the no-hesitation-style targets. And, uh, and they desensitize people. In, in my day of law enforcement, and certainly I, Mr. Gordon as well, and my dad when he was a lawman uh, in, in the early 70s, if you drew your gun and you fired on someone, it's because you had no other earthly alternative. Right. You were left, no other choice. And, and, and amongst your peers, your fellow officers, you were not considered a hero. You, you were considered a failure, and let me clarify when I say that. You were considered a failure in the sense that you failed at your job of de-escalating that situation. You, you were not able to physically take control. Uh, you were not able to vo verbally take control, and, and things disintegrated to the point that you had to take a human life. Right. It was not a glorious thing. You weren't taken out to dinner. You didn't go out and get a tattoo. Uh, like some of these officers have quite literally done. You didn't get a promotion over it. It was a disgraceful thing. It was, it was a difficult thing to deal with. Now, I'm not saying there's not justifiable shooting. Of right. course there is. Right. There, there absolutely is. And there's some wonderful, incredible officers out there who have been put in very difficult situations that they were forced to take a human life. Right. I'm not faulting them. Right. What I am talking about is something that is very, very different. In fact, it's diametrically opposed to that type of a scenario. I'm talking about a situation where someone is 35 feet away from you with a butter knife. You draw your firearm and shoot and kill that person because they were threatening to kill themselves. Right. How can you live with yourself? How can you justify?
justify that sort of behavior. And that kind of behavior has really become the norm here in the Albuquerque area. Um, I, I really, I, I'm fearful every time, you know, I see lights behind me in the Albuquerque area, uh, you know, I just cringe. I start swaying, I'm gripping the steering wheel. I'm thinking, I pray they're not pulling me over because it could be the last thing I ever do is get pulled over. Uh, and Albert, if you if you do something that they, for whatever reason, feel to be a threat, they're going to shoot you. Right, and you know, and just on on what you were saying with the with the butter knife situation, had that been a law abiding, uh, gun owning citizen, okay, and the the person was thirty five foot away and they were a concealed carry permit holder or just even. Uh, open carry if it's allowed in that state I'm not sure but had they been 35 foot away and the law-abiding citizen shot that person they would be in jail a law-abiding citizen whether you're a CCW carrier or whether you're carrying openly however depending on what you choose to do you're responsible for every bullet and that would not be consistent or considered justifiable homicide on an average citizen that's not carrying a badge. Well, I, I have to agree with you. you know, if you look at it, by and large, I know Mr. Gordon was talking about the corruption there in Las Vegas. And uh, well, how, it's how everywhere in Nevada. It's you know, everywhere you know, in Nevada. Take my word. You know, you look at a, at a state uh, or a city specifically, you know, Clark County, the Las Vegas city, where prostitution and pornography flow through the streets like open sewers. I, I would submit to you that that particular demographic has lost its moral compass. And I think that's leading to these other behaviors, uh, like with the BLM and, and other, other issues, the, the issue with the missing officer who was found dead and so on and so forth. So, you know, I, I, I don't think it's any different here in Albuquerque. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of the heart. It's an issue of morals and ethics. Uh, the last time I was in the academy, I spoke with the, uh, the director of the academy, here in New Mexico, and I said, why, you know, in this block of instruction, we, we were having what's called biennium training. It's a 40 hours of advanced training, which is required to keep your certification. Nowhere in that cert in that uh, biennium training was there any ethics. There was not a single block for ethics. And I confronted the director about this. I said, why do we not, and we've got all this training, like over half the training was devoted to how to kill people. It was all right. about defensive tactics and shoot to kill all this stuff, I said, where, where are the ethics? Where, where, I don't see any block of instruction for ethics. And the response I got, you know the response I got, Mr. Gordon? The response right. that I got was, well, we don't need to teach anyone ethics. You're just supposed to know how to behave in an ethical manner. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, Matt, but uh, I copyrighted the phrase policing with ethics. Wow, I did not know that. Oh, yeah, I did. And uh, it's on the bottom of uh, every one of my uh, campaign signs, Policing with Ethics. And I copyrighted that uh, particular phrase. Anyway, uh, it's, uh, do you agree that uh, if, if you're in an organization, especially, uh, uh, let's say, one the size of Las Vegas, okay, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, would you agree that there are no secrets in that police department. Well, I would find that very hard to believe that there are no secrets. Uh, we're talking about okay, I said there was no law. Well, I, I guess maybe I, I should this way. I should say, if well, we'll just talk about shootings. Just for instance, officer-involved shootings. I think it would depend on what level you're talking about, Gordon, as far as, because, I mean, you probably have. All right, gentlemen, I would like to discuss a lot of people and leftist media have tried to portray Richard Mack as some evil person because he, quote, unquote, said that he wanted to put women and children on the front line, and if they were the first ones uh, to be shot, then that would show what BLM is is all about. Now, we all know that the spin on that was completely inaccurate, so I would like for y'all to chime in 
and and give me your opinions and then I will chime in with mine. Um, what is your opinion on that, Shane? Well, having been there firsthand, um, having spoken to Sheriff Mack uh, firsthand when, when that statement was delivered, I'm fully aware as to the context it was delivered in, uh, the spirit in which it was delivered. Um, Sheriff Mack and I, uh, along with uh, Sheriff Mack's son, was, was ha we were having a conversation about what was, what was transpiring, what, what had just finished transpiring there with BLM, and how there were women on the front line. No one pushed them out there. No one used them as a human shield. These are American women, cowgirls who've got guts. Women are tough. <laughs> you know, a, a lot of people, you know, want to downplay the role of, of the American woman. I'm here to tell you, women are strong. They're determined. And they're tough. And these women, they got out there on their own accord, standing for liberty. They're like, uh uh, you ain't gonna stop me. I'm getting out there. I'm gonna stand for my liberty. You ain't gonna get in my way. I mean, these women were tough. Right. And Sheriff Mack and I were having a conversation about that. And there was a lot of rhetoric involved. Uh, Sheriff Mack made the statement to me that can you imagine what it would have been like had DLM fired? on all these women that were on the front lines standing for liberty. Can you imagine what that would have looked like? Right. Now, that conversation somehow got spun by the media uh, and, and got made out to be something that it was not. <coughs> um, this was an allegorical conversation uh, when Sheriff Mack was asked in front of the media about this type of rhetoric. Um, he, he displayed um, the story pretty much the same way as, that he and I were discussing it. And the, the media took it and spun the context and only played a soundbite of what he, he had said. Right. They didn't play the conversation in its entirety. And I can tell you that it was utterly disgusting. You know, journalists are supposed to uh, seek to, to, to put out the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In this particular case, they, they distorted the truth to, in such a fashion that it became a lie. And it was egregious, it was disgusting. Uh, on multiple levels, I, I was really sickened when I saw what they had done to a patriot like Sheriff Mack. Right, right. And you tend to see that more and more these days because they really want to demonize patriots. They want to demonize anybody who's for the Constitution. And anybody that they can take and twist their words and, and what they believe in order to make them look like they're a bad guy or to get this group hating him because see he hates women or see he hates children um and and doesn't really truly care about anything except his own personal agenda and and that's the way they like to spin it in order to vilify um the... well, well you see where they're going with this if, oh, you know, absolutely they saw all these patriots go out there and stand for liberty what could they possibly do so immediately they start trying to paint uh sheriff back as a sexist and a coward they immediately start trying to paint uh, Private Bundy as a racist. Mm -hmm. And if you notice in the photos, the majority of the photos that were presented along with that raci racial uh, issue is they, they only photographed the white patriots right. that had shaved heads and tattoos right. that were out there. They did not uh, photograph uh, the multitude of Hispanic and African American uh, patriots that were out there. Absolutely. And, and I, that's just one more aspect to, to the disinformation they're putting out there. I agree with you completely on that. I saw quite a few um, quite a few pictures with, with the African Americans and Hispanics standing, you know, with the Caucasians as well. And um, so I kind of did photo clips on that and I shared that as well to individuals and said, look, you know, Mainstream media is trying to make it look like this is a quote-unquote redneck thing or uh, this is just a uh, lunatic domestic terrorist, as they like to call us, which they have to vilify, you know, um, anybody and everybody in order to justify the murder of them, just like him.